Okay, let's try to be here now. The place where everything happens, but the place that never seems like it's enough. We always think the future is going to be better. But all that is needed for wholeness, for freedom, is in the now. So loving God, we seek to accept this now, this moment, where you are and where we want to be. We thank you for these sisters and brothers. We come here today seeking wisdom. We ask for your guidance. and We ask that we can be good listeners. We pray gratefully in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, as I told you a few days ago, this talk is now the counterpart to the one we gave you on liberation theology. But in many ways, of the two talks, this is really the more demanding, or if you want to use the word, the more radical. I think the contemplative mind is the most absolute assault on the um, secular worldview that you can, you can have. Because it really is a different mind. And what we've been doing, uh, I think this has been the failure of so much of liberalism, is it has been trying to uh, critique uh, from really the same mind. <laughs> And uh, that'll make more sense uh, later. But it's still what I'm going to call the calculative mind or the calculating mind. It's the egocentric mind that reads everything in terms of personal advantage, in terms of uh, usually short-term effect, in terms of what's in it for me and how will I look and how will I look good. As long as you read reality from that small self, and read everything calculatively, uh, I don't think you're going to see things in any uh, really new way. Uh, maybe you'll move along the political spectrum from left to right or right to left. But uh, what all the great religions have talked about is a different way of seeing that is actually a different perspective, a different vantage point, a different starting point. I use uh, often Albert Einstein's quotes. Uh, he said, no problem can be solved by the same consciousness that caused it. Now what we're trying to do is solve our problems by the same consciousness that caused them. Um, which read everything in terms of cause and effect and, and personal advantage. The word contemplation really only became popular again uh, through really Thomas Merton's writings in the 50s and 60s. Uh, probably a lot of religions used the word meditation. Actually, the word most Christians are familiar with is simply the word prayer. But the word prayer became, unfortunately, in the West, like everything did in the West, became something functional, something you did, again, to achieve a desired effect. Put, which puts you back in charge. As soon as you make prayer a way to get something and listen to most uh, prayers, that's what they are, and it's okay. I think God's used to it by now. <laughs> but <clears throat> it's really not any kind of new state or new consciousness. It's the same old consciousness. How can I get God to do what I want God to do? You know, and so I'll, maybe I'll talk to him about it. You know? Cure my grandma. You know, well, I guess if he gets enough, he's probably counting, or she's probably counting. How many cure my grandmas do I get? And if I get enough of them, I'll do it. Huh? That, but that's where most people are at with prayer. It's not really a change of consciousness. It's the egocentric self deciding what it needs and what it wants and resorting to what we now call a higher power, because you can't get any better than that, to get on your side, to get what you want. Huh? So you can basically remain an untransformed, egocentric person 
who's just now, instead of manipulating everybody else, which is all the ego can do, is it now tries to manipulate God. Now, that's why I, at least one re re reason, I think, religion is in such desperate straits today. Because it really isn't transforming people. It's, it's merely giving people some, uh, some pious and religious ways to again be in charge and to again be in control. It's still the small self. And what a genuine uh, religion is talking about is a transformed self. It's a different I. Paul uses uh, that wonderful phrase, I live no longer not I. It's a different I, a different sense of self that's here. I think until you've come to that, you're not at, at uh, foundational transformation. You might be pious, you might be denominational, you might be religious in the uh, way the term is normally used, you might belong to some, some group, um, but it's still what we'll call the small self. Let me use a quote I've been using now for the last three years, I think, from Ken Wilber. This is in his uh, set of journal entries called One Taste. And he says, religion has always performed two very important but very different functions. First, it acts as a way of creating meaning for the separate self. It offers myths, stories, tales, narratives, rituals, and revivals that taken together help the separate self to make sense of and to endure the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And that's okay. That's how you got to get started. As the psychologist would say, you got to have an ego to let go of an ego. You got to have a self to move beyond the self. But what most religion does is it stops at that first function of simply giving you a positive self image that I'm a religious person, or I'm a moral person, or I'm a dedicated person, or whatever it might be. This function of religion does not usually or necessarily change the level of consciousness in a person. It does not deliver radical transformation. It does not deliver a shattering liberation from the separate self. It consoles the self, fortifies the self, defends the self, and promotes the self. I talked to some mediators some years ago who work with major corporations. And they said that uh, they reserve their very best educated people in the work of mediation to work with churches. Because church people tend to be the most opinionated, right? hard to work with people. They'd sooner work with the business world than with church people. <laughs> Because church people are all convinced they're right. I mean, that's the whole point of religion, to make sure you're right. And once you start with that starting point, to make sure I'm right, it, it has disastrous effects. Religion is the worst thing in the world, and it's the best thing in the world at the same time. If it stops at the first function of religion, which I think most religion does, it's the worst thing in the world. All it creates is highly egocentric people, and they have the most clever cover for their egocentricity. They're egocentric for God. They're egocentric for morality, or for the church, or for piety, or for, uh, you know, flag and country, or something like that. They're usually, you, you can't touch them, you know, because the ego has a, is a hardened silo. It's sure that it's right. Now he says, as long as the separate self believes the myths, performs the rituals, mouths the prayers, embraces the dogma, then the self it is fervently believed will be saved. We're not really sure what that's supposed to mean, but everybody uses the word rather glibly, huh? being saved. I suppose in most Western Christians' mind, it means going to heaven. I'm going to get some reward later you know, for doing this. And the whole thing is, I always call it a very bad reward punishment novel. You know, it's, it's preposterous that anybody believes it, but uh, if you haven't really worked with it, and I'm just lucky enough to have had time to work with it, I, you believe it because everybody else does. And you think, well, this many people can't be wrong. You know, they must be right. It's, life is a giant reward punishment system. And if you jump the hoops right, uh, you'll get the reward. It's not about transformation. Can you feel the difference? Hmm? You don't have to be transformed. 
You just have to play the game right. <laughs> and uh, this is what we're dealing with today. Now he goes on and he says, religion has also served in a usually very, very small minority. His analysis is pessimistic. The function of radical transformation and liberation. This function of religion does not fortify the separate self, but utterly shatters it. Not consolation, but devastation. Not entrenchment, but emptiness. Now, this is why your great spiritual teachers will always talk about descent, the way of the cross, emptiness, letting go. Not complacency, but devastation. Not entrenchment, but emptiness. Not complacency, but explosion. Not comfort, but revolution. In short, not a conventional bolstering of consciousness, but a radical transmutation and transformation of consciousness at its deepest level. That is what we mean by religious conversion. Now, how that normally happens is by what we would call a God encounter, where your natural egocentricity is undercut. It doesn't work anymore. It doesn't make sense anymore. In other words, you have to find a center outside of yourself that is in fact the center. Up to that point, you're eccentric in the true, you're off center. And most people are eccentric. You're, you're, you're not the center of the world at all, but you act as if you are. Everything is, do I like it? Do I want it? Do I, do I look good? Is my name on it? You know, who cares? But a lot of people do. That's all they have, you know? It seems like someone took my markers here. You know? Maybe they're in here. Here they are. Okay. Um, now, what I'm going to do is try to give you two different diagrams so, so we can understand this. It almost takes a, a, a simple imaging of it. Um, uh, and it really is very simple. Maybe you'll even say simplistic. But I'm going to call this the false self. Now this is, I'm afraid, what we're doing a lot of times is we're baptizing the false self, we're <laughs> ordaining the false self, we're giving communion to the false self. The false self is this little autonomous thing over here that tries to dress itself up, fortify itself as we just make itself look Christian or Catholic or religious or whatever it wants to be, or moral. Now, people like Jesus come along, and in the presence of that, they say, unless the grain of wheat die, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. Or he'll say, the branch cut off from the vine is useless. That's a really strong statement. It's useless. He, he goes even further. He says, you might as well... Um, you know, throw it into the fire. It's a waste of time working with this thing. And yet that's exactly what we're doing. He's largely working with this false self. And the way we start, we all start here, there's, there probably, and God certainly understands this, is we gaze at our navel and see, are we doing it right? And the question always is, how do I get over here? Now, over here, I guess you could call this God, heaven, eternity, the truth, the mystery, and the question is, what are the rules, what are the rituals, what are the practices that I can perform to get God to like me? That's where, in effect, everybody starts. They wouldn't put it in those words, right? But everybody does. You know? uh, and it's an okay starting place. It's just not a good continuing place. And it's a terrible ending place. You know? Now, I want to right away, because we're going to jump back and forth to understand these, because this is necessary, by the way, to understand contemplation and the contemplative mind, we're going to draw the true self. Hmm? This is the only self that's ever existed. It's the only self that exists right now. The trouble is most people don't know it. <laughs> they really don't. And the work of religion is to get you to know this. Religio, the very word means to rebind, to reconnect. You came forth from God. Your deepest DNA is divine. You are not human beings trying to become spiritual. That's how everybody starts. You are already spiritual beings. And the profound question is how to be human. I believe that's why Jesus came as a human being. Not to teach us how to go to heaven. To teach us how to be a human being here on this earth. Can you imagine how different the history of Western Christianity would have been? 
if we would have concentrated on teaching Christians how to be human beings in this world. Instead of all this heaven talk. Huh? All, remember I said in the first prayer, it's all about now, but how you do it now. We took all the power out of the now, and we put all the power into the future. Everything was a reward, punishment, was going to happen later. And so now was sort of a game, or an obstacle course, or a testing ground, that you really didn't take it in itself seriously. It's all play acting, and hopefully playing it right so that you get the reward later. So here I have the, the small self, and you can call it that if you want. Psychologically, Jung would call this the small self and call this the great self with the big S. When the small self knows that it has no meaning, no foundation, apart from who it is in God, uh, that's transformation. When I live no longer, not I. That is a different experience of the cell. Just as you have a heart transplant, this is an identity transplant. Just as you have a lung transplant or a liver transplant, it is a, I can't say it's strong enough, <coughs> it's a different sense of the I. A different sense of the self. A different sense of the who that you are. I always love to say, <coughs> excuse me, we got to get the who right. Who are we? Hmm? Who are we? And most people don't know. They think <coughs> they are this private self. This Richard thing, hmm? this Ben thing, <coughs> this Judy thing, this Susan thing, all of which is fine, but Merton says it so well, he says one thing for sure about heaven, there won't be much of you there. Hmm? In other words, the you that you think is you, this little thing, now, this is secular consciousness. This is the world we live in today. This is what people, that's all you have. And so you have to dress it up. You have to defend it. You can make a pretty general statement. Whenever you're defensive, it's always the false self. This self is so secure, it never has any, re it doesn't have any, there's, there's nothing to defend if you follow me. <coughs> There's nothing to <coughs> be offended. And I tell many people, that's how you know you're living in the false self at that moment, if you take offense at anything. If you took offense in the kitchen at Tepeyac this morning because <coughs> someone uh, didn't clean up after themselves. I mean, I probably would have too. But don't do it for more than 15 seconds, you know. Because for more than 15 seconds, that's just your little insecure self that needs to be pampered or needs to, to define itself by cleanliness or whatever it might be, or order, you know. This self is pretty unoffendable. It really is. It's just, uh, I can see why the Bible said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You'll get angry for a few minutes, but you can't identify with it. You can't feed it. You don't let it possess you, as I said last week. Huh? Now, the, 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 the rules here are uh, sort of the rules of what I'm going to call requirement religion. It's always looking for what are the correct requirements. And every religion is convinced that it has the correct requirements. Huh? It, it forces you toward legalism and ritualism eventually. Huh? Here, it's not about requirements, it's about relationship. The quality and your capacity for relatedness. Now, I hope you can see how I'm laying <coughs> the foundation for contemplation. Because this self will say prayers, but this self is a prayer. Just by being, just by walking from here to there, it is a prayer. Now, that's why Paul can say something like, pray always. He doesn't mean, he can't mean walking around saying, Our Fathers and Hail Marys, huh? But when, how you can pray always is when you live in conscious union with God. It's really not, this is the surprise for most people, it's really not about being perfect. <laughs> 
Um, this self will still make mistakes, but it lives from a center ever other than its own. Now, until and unless you've met a centered person, a grounded person, who you can tell their center is outside themselves, it's almost hard to get the feel for this. You have to have met a saint. In fact, my definition of Christianity in recent years has been a Christian is someone who's met one. That this whole thing is contagious. Huh? Uh, when you meet a person of a certain quality of maturity, that's how you get maturity. Yeah? You meet a patient person and you learn how to be patient. You meet a loving person and you learn how to be loving. That's, that's the way human beings operate. You don't even know how to do it. Huh? And it's the same way with this. When you meet a really grounded, happy, free person, you can just feel the water rise. You become more like that because you'll be satisfied with nothing less. That becomes the reference point or the criteria. This whole thing spreads, uh, you know, like a contagion, really. But it spreads through relationship, huh? by the quality of one's relationship. Now, what we'd say is happening in prayer is you're experiencing that quality of relationship with God, where you know you're not being manipulated, you're not being used, you're not being judged, you're not being evaluated. Boy, who wouldn't go there? I mean, that's just the place of ultimate freedom. That's the state that every one of us wants to live in. So that's why we tell people, you know, go pray a half an hour a day or whatever it might be. Because you live in this place. Uh, you become this. It's, it's sort of that simple. It, it, it rubs off on you. I don't know what other way to say it. So I want to say as strongly as I can that all of the institutes of religion, uh, Bible, sacraments, uh, priesthood, churches, everything, everything, rosary, way of the cross, contemplative, sit, is to help you experience this self. Pure and simple, that's all. And if, and if your religion isn't helping you experience this self, then change it, <laughs> or get rid of it, or do something different. Huh? If it's maintaining you in this self, then we got a problem. And a lot of religion is. This is the religion that fought Jesus because it was all into to, uh, dogmatism and requirements. And when Jesus wasn't following their dogmas and requirements, they had to get rid of him. So if this is about requirement, this is not just about relationship, but it's about right relationship. How do you, how do you connect in a way that's really connection? This is about being correct, do you see? How, am I correct? Am I right? I always say you'd think the first commandment was, thou shalt be right. Huh? <laughs> that is, it, it, here's a, it's not about being correct, it's about being connected. Connected. Unless the, the vine is connected, or the branch is connected to the vine, we have a problem. Now, how does God achieve this? This is the process of transformation. What life will do to you anyway, but most people don't have the, the freedom to recognize it and to allow it. What life will do to you, and I'm going to use religious language and say God will do it to you. God has to, in the course of your years, destabilize that private ego. The word for that is suffering. Mental suffering, emotional suffering, physical suffering, relational suffering, things that you can't fix, that you can't control, that you can't explain, you can't change. There is no way, and you gotta be honest at this point, your ego is not gonna give up until it has to. You know that. You know that. It's not, as long as you're goody two shoes and looking good and feeling good and everybody's admiring you and you know, you're the best Catholic in Oregon, I mean, why would you change? You're feeling quite well without God, thank you. Oh, you're very pious. You're very religious, but you don't really need God. You're admiring your own uh, advancement, your own maturity, so-called, you see? So God has to let you fail. Now, I always say, therefore, there are two people who have a head start in the spiritual life, or two groups of people, sinners and mystics. Mystics are those who, in this inner journey, 
consciously let go of those ego boundaries and collapse back in to who they really were anyway, but didn't know it. You, you are this right now, all right? That's all you've ever been. But hardly anybody knows it, do you see? And what you're doing in your contemplative sit is consciously experiencing that. Not knowing it through the head level, experiencing it through the body, gut level. It has to be experienced. You can't teach people this. Even though I'm trying to tell you right now, all right? You won't believe me. You will leave here and live just like you always did until you know this for yourself. And then it's not a matter of belief. I don't believe this. I know this. It's not a matter of... Uh, people think religion is believing unbelievable things. I, <laughs> it is believing unprovable things. But these things can clearly be experienced. Huh? Where you know it, it's the only thing that that finally makes, makes sense of, of what's happening. No? So the real task, brothers and sisters, is far different. Here we thought it was how to get this over here. The real question is, no, is how to get from here to here, where you were anyway, but you didn't know it. Right. <laughs> so it's all a matter of awakening. It's all a matter of awareness. Now this self is capable of contemplation. That's all. It's that simple. It will now read reality, not from this egocentric position. Remember how I started a few minutes ago? Has to read everything in terms of personal advantage and how do I look? And what, what will this gain me? This, its center, is over here. Hmm? To use religious language, we'd say uh, we don't look at things through our own eyes, but through the eyes of God. That's, that's the truth. <laughs> Now, it's a more panoramic seeing. It's a broader seeing. It, it, uh, it can read reality in the way of wisdom. Wisdom, which is broad enough to absorb paradox and contradictions and inconsistencies. If, if this self is characterized by fragility, and it is, this self is very fragile. And it well should be. Anything that doesn't exist should be fragile. Huh? Uh, th this is characterized by abundance. That word has become very popular in recent years, and I think with good reason. And you feel that when you're around a grounded person, a sense of inner abundance, a sense of I've got plenty. They're not grasping. They're not protecting. They're not always needing more and, and counting how much did you get and how much did I get? Which is all this thing here can do. do you, I hope you're starting to see the linkage between this and your politics and economics. <laughs> I mean, it's everything. And that's why I don't believe much in liberal politics. Because the liberal over here, just because he's put a liberal tag on himself, <laughs> he really isn't going to be any better. We have all these limousine liberals, you know, who have a liberal politics, but they're still into it. Looking good, having the best of everything. Uh, there's no great freedom in being a liberal false self. Do you follow me? <laughs> this is the freedom. Because hmm? here you don't have a lot to protect. Now that's why I said at the beginning, this is the ultimate assault, assault on the secular mind, is religious transformation. These people can't be bought off by any system. They don't need its rewards. They're drawing their life from within. They don't need the perks and privileges and promotions, power, prestige, and possessions, as I used to call them always on my tapes. Huh? And if you look at the teaching of Jesus, that's what his warnings are against, power, prestige, and possessions. Not because those things are evil in themselves. That's not the point. The, they're, they're simply a giveaway that you're still living here. In fact, almost everything you call sin, almost everything you call sin, is really a symptom of sin. The fact that you are grasping and jealous and impatient means at that moment you're living out of this cell. You follow me? That's all. It's not if you're grasping and impatient, I'm not going to like you. That's just what most people think inside of the reward punishment thing. It's just you're not free yet. And those are the indications, the things that we call sin, are the indications that you're not living here. Now, to, to uh, 
help you trust this a little more and to be fair about it, I do want to say that life is a dance between the true self and the false self. I don't know anybody, including Mother Teresa, who lives 24 hours a day over here. She probably lived 23 and a half over here, you know. But, but uh, I worked with her community in Calcutta four years ago, at, right after she died. And, and, you know, I became aware of her little faults, too. Thank God, it was such a relief to find out. Even Mother Teresa had little faults, just like you and I do, you know. Join the human race. We're all in this together. So she, uh, you know, did this dance, too. It's okay to live in the false self. Just, now listen closely. Just don't believe it. You follow me? Don't, don't believe this thing. Don't offer it any incense. Don't, don't kiss up to it. And don't expect other people to. Or you'll, uh, you'll spend a life of, of total uh, you know, upsetness, which is what most people do, just waiting to be upset. Because you know? this thing is living on the edge of upsetness all the time. Huh? In fact, after you've lived here 40 years or so, like when you're my age, it's just, this thing is so, uh, it knows it isn't there yet. It feels that foundational ungroundedness or insecurity. So you'll tend to see people dance faster and faster, become more rigid, become more demanding, more controlling. Most people my age are control freaks. Almost all of them are. Because that's the only way you can feel that some way you're, you're a, you're in control, is <laughs> to take control. This one doesn't, there's nothing to take control of because someone else is much better in control. And you know that experientially. You know that experientially. That someone else is in control anyway. And, and here the rules are trust and letting go and surrender. They're, they're not about uh, making it right. You don't need to push the river over here. You've got to push the river over there. So. In a certain sense, I always say when I'm teaching this that even me standing here right now, I'm living out of the false self in a certain way. I've got my hat of teacher on, and I'm fulfilling a role. Whenever you've got a role, you, you take yourself a little uh, more seriously than you really need to. Uh, and that's all right. As long as when this session is over, I can step off my podium and walk out the door and know who I am apart from being the teacher, do you see? And I don't need you to kiss up to this, and I don't need to take my own PR too seriously. Now, you've got to know that most people don't know how to do that. Hmm? Now, now the, the spiritual word for that was attachment, that you become attached to this thing, because that's all you've got. Right? And if other people don't like it, or talk about it, or criticize it, you fall apart, or you become defensive, or even violent toward them. Because that's all you've got, is the defense of this thing that you've concocted and created, and is going to die anyway. It doesn't mean a hell of beans. Huh? You know, the first time I was invited to India, uh, they told me something. They wanted me, of all things, to teach the Enneagram. In fact, next month they want me to again. And, I'm always surprised why would the Indian people with their immense social problems want to learn about the Enneagram, you know? They said, because you in America, you know everything about personality and you know almost nothing about essence. <laughs> they said, but we know a lot about essence, but we don't know much about personality. Now I just tell you that about, to show, they are the, the Indian culture, which is so ancient, such a profound sense of this being united. You find it in most native spiritualities, too, that we're a part of something. That my life is not about me. I'm about life. And I'm an instance of this great big life. But what happened, especially after the immense intellectual achievements of the West, uh, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the scientific technological revolution, is we absolutely exploded the individual self. Nowhere has the individual self been so developed as in North America and Europe. Europe even more than here. And um, in a certain sense. Um, and so I think that's why contemplative teaching is so important here and also so very, very difficult for us. Because we just can't imagine letting go of this because this is all we have anymore, you see? 
And what most uh, self-help programs are today are giving you ways to teach this thing here how to cope. And coping mechanisms, right? Survival mechanisms for the false self. As we say, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, you know? I mean, the whole thing is going down. It's a useless project. Now, as impatient and angry as I get at religion, why I can't give up on religion is because religion, healthy religion, is the only thing prepared to describe the movement from here to here. If you don't use God talk, I mean, why would you give up control if there was not someone you trusted that you could give up control to? The secular mind is burdened with creating control freaks. That's all you can produce in secular society. In fact, I always say, you'd be irresponsible not to be, wouldn't you? I mean, you know, you have to see that everything's working and everything's right and everything's fixed. And you better, because no one else is going to do it. <laughs> There's no sense that the universe is on my side, as some saying, that, that I'm already in the flow, that I don't have to push the river, I'm in the river. I don't have to create the story. The story is happening. And I'm now, you know, the six billionth one on the planet right now to be living this story. And what is the story? It's death and resurrection. Every religion is saying that in one sense or another. It's all about death and resurrection and trusting it. Now, Jesus came to live that in a, a very living icon. Christ has died, Christ has risen. Trust the death, and that breaks you through to the resurrection. Now this, if you've lived over here, listen closely, if you've lived over here for 40 years or 50 years, and, and, you, and this starts being destabilized, all right? You get your first big suffering at 50, you know, <laughs> a death in the family or something like that. Uh, you're going to fight it with everything you can. You're going to look for somebody to blame, you're going to look for somebody to attack, and it's going to feel like dying. It's going to feel like dying. You, if you haven't had training in dying, <laughs> if you, don't, you haven't had any training in letting go and in trusting a bigger mystery, a bigger process, a bigger benevolence, a bigger pattern, use whatever word you want, you, you won't surrender to this. You will try even harder to, to be back in control. And that, I'm afraid, is an awful lot of older people trying even more to stabilize the whole thing and to solidify the whole thing. So this movement, back to who you already were, it will feel like letting go. It will feel like losing. Some have said that uh, what Christianity is really about is how to lose graciously. That's the meaning of the cross. What else would that be a symbol of? How to lose graciously. And uh, if someone hadn't told you how to do that, why would you know? It's not even your fault. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, that's what we're up against, though, in this Western society. And why I think we're going to see a lot of violence, a lot of uh, people on the attack in various ways, because because they don't have any language of, of dying available to them, of letting go. And so when the letting go is demanded of them, most people are going to look for somebody to blame and going to look for somebody to attack or someone else to change. It'll always be someone else's fault. So now maybe you can understand this passage from John in a whole new way. John 15, Whoever remains in me as I in them will bear much fruit. Hmm? That's what he's talking about. In fact, that's the language of all of the mystics, is the language of union. If it's not the language of union, don't, uh, uh, in fact, don't trust it. So as I said before, it's all about getting the who right. And once you have the right who, who are you? That's the, who are you? And just every day, ask it of yourself again, who am I? You're a daughter of God, would be the, the religious language, huh? A son of God. This is merely my geometric way of imaging that, that, that religious language that we've grown up with. It's not so much what we do, but the who that is acting is what liberates and brings life to the world. 
I really believe that. Mother Teresa said that also. She said, a person consciously filling a vase with water out of union and love with, of God is giving more glory to God than a priest at the altar who's standing there in a state of anger or resentment or separateness. It's all about the who, not the what. And we spend all of our time concentrating on what should I do? Which, remember, was the question of the rich young man. What must I do to inherit eternal life? I often have said to people, I don't think it matters what you do. It really, so you do you see how the whole secular, uh, sacred thing absolutely breaks down? There is no such thing as a secular job. You could be a, a CEO of a secular institution, and if you're doing it out of conscious, chosen union with God, you, you will bring more of God's energy and life into the world than a formally professional religious person who's doing it out of a state of anger, judgment, or separation. That's why the contemplative mind really has little to do with being pious or religious or churchy in any, in any classic sense. And how the whole thing breaks down between the secular and the sacred. So the autonomous false self can do objectively good things, and I believe God will still use them, but they will not bear nearly as much fruit as even simple things done in union with God out of what we'd call the true self. That is about as traditional and conservative and old-fashioned teaching as I could. I mean, you, if you were raised religious, you were taught that way back when. That, that just doesn't change. Huh? Yet it's utterly radical even today. And the thing is that even though this is who we are, it's hard for us to consciously live there. Merton says so many good things to illustrate this. He says, I would sooner have the sins of this person than the virtues of this person. Have you ever met someone who's very virtuous? And you want to say, if that's virtue, I don't want it. Hmm? If that's holiness, it feels so stuffy and priggish and self-conscious and, and so forth. And this person over here, I mean, if you're living in the true self at least an hour a day, you'll still make mistakes. You'll still do stupid things. That's why I say, it isn't about being a morally perfect person. I know I'm not. But, but you'd know it when you're doing it. And just, you see it. You're not satisfied with it. You, you, can, you can apologize. You can admit you're wrong. Uh, this self has a pretty hard time admitting it's wrong. Because that's all it has, is its righteousness. Do you see? <laughs> this, when Paul says, I have no righteousness of my own, but only the righteousness that comes from union with Christ Jesus my Lord. There it is. <laughs> it's a different righteousness. Huh? It doesn't go up and down. It doesn't depend upon feelings. Huh? That's, what, that's why they spoke of God being your rock, your savior, your deliverer. This person is utterly solid and grounded. Huh? Their feelings don't go up and down each day depending upon who likes them. They're not, to use our contemporary term, they're not codependent. Huh? This self is very, very codependent. Needs constant feedback, affirmation, approval, incense. Offer me some incense. You know? this, this can get by with less and less. Because it's drawing its life from within. Happiness is an inside job. Do you see? This will need more and more outside. Money, clothes, cars, right place to live, status symbols. It's just, you know, it's like the alcoholics say, you need more and more of what doesn't work. And you can see, that, remember I said, you dance faster and faster over there. You just, uh, you know, a more elaborate vacation bigger house, a, uh, a fancier car. Just You can just see every five years in America, uh, sophistication just goes higher and higher. I need this to be happy, and then I need that to be happy. And once you reach that level, you can never go back. Whereas the saints, they need less and less to make them happy. It's really that simple. Their, their, their contentment is from within. They're not expecting 
the future to be any different than it is right now. Because how you do the now, now we're going to tie into contemplative practice, how you do anything is how you do everything. And if you're accessing the now, God, being, consciousness, what is, use whatever word you're comfortable with, it doesn't really matter. If you're accessing that right now, then you're going to have found the wellsprings of joy right now. And then you'll carry that into the future too. Uh, if not, I can tell you, you can be on a beach in Hawaii. All right? Picture your perfect beach. All right? And I'll promise you, when you're there, you're gonna, your mind is going to be doing the same things on that beach that it's doing right now. <laughs> Judging, if that's what you're doing. Critiquing, negating. Because uh, that's who you are. <laughs> And you've all been there. I mean, I've been there. Haven't you been on the perfect vacation that you look forward to for weeks? <laughs> and you get there and say, I'm really not happy. <laughs> you know, I'm supposed to be happy. This is all because you're still upset. You're still angry. You're still fearful. You're whatever you are. So contemplation is saying, change it right here. Or don't expect the future to be any different than the now. It isn't. Nothing's going to change. And if you can't believe that God is here right now, when you go to Mass or church tomorrow, God isn't going to be there either because you won't know how to access that moment any differently. So I always say that presence, and that's, that's the key word, you know? presence is a relational term. And you can offer people the real presence in the Eucharist, perhaps, but if you don't know how to be present to presence, there is no presence. <laughs> now what we're doing in contemplation, this is, you're learning how to be present. That's, that's really it. You're learning how to access what is. Now, the reason most people run from it is because you know what comes up first? The garbage. Remember when it says the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. And it says there he met the wild beasts. This is Mark 1, 13 to 15. The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. There he met the wild beasts. And... Angels ministered to him. I'm afraid first what comes up is the garbage. That's why most teachers insist on at least 20 minutes. Because you can assume that the first, well, sometimes my whole 20 minutes is the, just the garbage. <laughs> but you can assume certainly the first half of any set, sit is just letting go of those thoughts that want to impose themselves on you, those judgments, those fears, those negations, that discomfort, that unprocessed conversation at breakfast, whatever it might be, all of that just keeps attacking you and assaulting you. So what you have to do is you have to become the watcher, where you step back from it and you see that judgment. Now that might sound to you at first like that's an intellectual game. It isn't. Do you see what's happening there is you're separating from it and you're letting it be over there. So now you know that feeling is not me. I'm over here watching it over there, which means it isn't me. Most people never do that. The feeling has them all the time. They never separate from it. And that's what it means to be possessed by a demon. The feeling has them. They feel they've got to have it. No, I don't have to have it. So Thomas Keating teaches this beautiful and almost simple boat exercise where he says, you sit on the bank of a stream, you observe each of your thoughts coming along saying, think me, think me, feeling, saying, feel me, feel me. Acknowledge you're having the feeling. Acknowledge that you're having the thought. Don't hate it. Don't judge it. Don't critique it. Don't, don't in any way move against it. But simply name it resentment toward so-and-so, thought about so-and-so. Admit that you're having it. He says, place it on a boat and let it go down the river. The river is your stream of consciousness. Now that's what you're doing in the first stages of contemplation. This self can't do it because all it has is its own thoughts. Most people think they are their thinking. Right? Most people think they are their thinking. They don't have a clue who they are apart from their thoughts. What you're doing in contemplation is moving to a level beneath your thoughts 
at the level of pure being, the level of, of really what we call pure consciousness, which is not consciousness of anything in particular. It's simply awareness. And now as soon as you think, I am doing this well, or I am aware, that's a boat. Or as soon as you think, oh, I'm doing this terribly. If he knew what I'm thinking about, this is a terrible thought I'm having, that's a boat too. Let go of that. <laughs> that's the ego trying to judge itself. And we'll always do that. Trying to and the only way the ego knows to do anything is up or down. Either I'm better or I'm worse than. It's always up or down, critiquing. Men tend to compete. Women tend to compare. But it's the same ego game. Trying to see wh whether I'm up or whether I'm down. We just, in pure being, there's no up and down. There just is. There's no evaluation. It's just uh, a, a, a delighting and a kind of spaciousness, a kind of freedom. Now those thoughts that come back for round two and round three and sometimes round four and five, those are your compulsive patterns of thinking. Some of you are going to see that you have paranoid patterns of fearing what might go wrong. Some of you are going to have uh, attack patterns of wanting to blame, change, fix, make things right. That's the, the type I am. And then there are some of you who are going to be the codependent types who are always, how am I looking? How am I feeling? How does everybody th relate to me and like me? And, and so forth, you know. And... Um, they're all ego games, they really are. Because you're a value without any of those. But there's, when you've played those mental uh, games for many years, you, you really don't know how not to do it. So remember, I'm not saying attack it the way we used to do dirty thoughts. Remember, oh, I had dirty thoughts. I just heard two hours of children's confessions this morning. Uh, you know, and it's all a attack these bad things. No, I'm not telling you attack, I'm saying observe it. That's all. The observing is actually more effective than the attacking. Did you know that? To attack something actually engages it in a negative way. It's the, the attraction of forbidden fruit. The generations of teenage boys we condemn to, to you know, by attacking their so-called dirty thoughts that only engaged them in a deeper level. No, you observe it and you see what you're doing. And you have to stand over here and see it and see that it's sort of useless. It's sort of a mental trip. But if you can't see that, you will be trapped by it. So that's early stage contemplation. Now, at that point, that doesn't sound very religious, does it? <laughs> Here is my point. That if God wants to get at you, and my assumption is God does, if God wants to get at you, if God wants to get through your barriers and your blockages, at that point, God has the best chance of doing it. Quite simply, because finally you're out of the way. With your ego, your judgments, your fears, your angers, your attachment to your own self-image. And it will have a lot to do with attachments. Attachments to feelings, attachments to thoughts, attachments to, to self-image. And you won't know how you attached you are to those things normally until they're taken from you. That's... That's why the mystics and saints talk so much about the necessity of suffering. That when things are taken from you, let's say just your dignity is taken from you. Huh? Not one of the interns spoke to you this morning. And so you're, you walk down the street chafing, you know, just chafing. That, uh, why don't they like me? And I knew they all think they're better than I. You know, and the mind just goes on. and That's all your false self trying to protect itself. But you can, you'll actually be able to thank God for that when you recognize that you would never have seen how much your false self is in control today if not for that humiliation. So basically, and I got this from Thomas Keating, although I totally believe it, he says he now charts the path of conversion as a series of necessary humiliations to the false self. It's that simple. That's what conversion is. A series of necessary humiliations to the false self. Now I know why my father Francis and so many of the saints prayed for humiliations. Because you, you will live here until this thing is humiliated, is taken from you. And then you'll see it for the silliness it is. 
So like when I take offense or I'm upset, I try to ask myself anymore, Richard, what part of you is upset now? What part of you is humiliated? What part of you is angry? What part of you wants to get him back? Hmm? And it is never my true self. I said that this at the National AIDS Conference a few years ago when I spoke at him. Who you are in God has never been hurt. This self can't be hurt. It's unhurtable. Now, when you see what we have, a victim culture today, <clears throat> everybody, act, in fact, trying to prove that they're more hurt than other people. I've been hurt the most. Now even white rich men are trying to prove that they're victims, you know, because that's the ultimate way for the ego to find power, you know, to prove that you've been hurt and you're a victim. There, this thing doesn't whine, you know. There's nothing to whine about. It's too satisfied. It's too content. It's too happy. Jesus says, this is the peace the world cannot give. This is the joy the world cannot take from you. This is what every one of you in this room wants. I can say that with, without any doubt. This is what we want. And we don't know it. <laughs> uh, the most common verb, by the way, used by the mystics is rest. This self can rest. Because it's home free. There's nothing to prove. There's nothing to protect. I don't have to pretend. There's nothing to live up to. I, I, I've already, do you understand? I've already got the conclusion. There's not, I'm not going to go to heaven. It's heaven all the way to heaven. I don't, I don't have to prove heaven to people. You can tell who is in heaven and you can tell who is in hell right now. And all God's going to do is say, I'll give you what you want. and You could have heaven now. So it's not a reward punishment system for if you play the game right, a giant SAT test, I'll reward you later. But I'm going to show you a way to live in the fullness of being now. I, I think an experience of God, and I mean this, it's not just because I'm a priest. I mean, it's why I had time to learn it, I suppose. But uh, I think an experience of God although you might not use those words, is necessary for mental and emotional health. I really do. Is necessary for mental and emotional health. You basically don't belong in the universe until you're connected to the center. And our word for the center is God. Right? You're eccentric in this position. You're off-center. And, and, and you're trying to make something the center that is not the center. It'll never work. It'll never, never, never work. Uh, this is just a little more continuation. The false self, as you'll see here, maintains itself by performance, the performance principle. Paul calls it the law. By requirements, by hierarchical assurance. The true self, and maybe this is why we clergy haven't taught it an awful lot. I, I don't want to be too cynical, but the true self doesn't need a lot of mental management. <laughs> It doesn't need a lot of uh, priestcraft. It doesn't need a lot of um, got to do this, got to do that, we'll do it for you. You know, I, I tried with all these little kids this morning making their first confessions, you know, to try to at least give them a first positive experience, you know. But you can tell some of them are just all in, I got to do this absolutely right or it won't work. <laughs> and I know, I guess we all start there, but yeah. You just hope they don't stay there, that's all. So I would call the false self a relative identity. I would call the true self your absolute identity. The true self will be a prayer. The true self can contemplate. The relative identity is not bad. The false self is not the bad self. It's simply, now listen closely, it's simply not the true self. Got it? It's not the bad self. This is not bad. It's simply not this. <laughs> now the trouble is, when you think this is all you have, and that's what most people, this is all they have. They never knew they had access to this. They never knew they were spiritual beings trying to become human. They think they're human beings trying to become spiritual. All right? <laughs> that, this is the only thing 
worthy of being called the good news. What else would be good news? This is good news. This really is bad news. It's terrible news. Because all you can do is live by the performance principle here. And you know what? Uh, Paul says in Romans, the law will always kill you. The law is his word for the performance principle. If you create any performance principle, I don't care what it is, you're going to be the perfect mother or the perfect housewife, or uh, uh, you, sooner or later you won't live up to it and you're going to hate yourself. Any external thing that you're going to do perfectly and therefore you are validated. This is the ultimate validation. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with you. It's given to you. Now this is what makes you fall in love with God. It's all gift. It, it's all. You want to weep. You want to kiss. Anything, I always say. You know? This, this is, is everything. It's all, it's all foundationally, radically okay. And, and it has nothing to do with you having done this or not having done that, which is the performance principle where everybody operates. So this mind looks out at reality in a calm, spacious way. It doesn't need to win anymore. It doesn't need to be better than anybody else. This self is capable of compassion, therefore, because it's not into competition and comparison. This self, racism wouldn't make any sense. Because you see, here, here's the big connection. Once you recognize the divine indwelling in you, and it has nothing to do with you, it's all pure gift, you know what? Yeah, maybe this is why people don't want to be converted. you got to recognize it in Jews and Hindus and black people and Protestants and whoever you decided not to like. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it, it, This is the, the great leveling of the playing field. You know, That's the meaning of, of Pentecost. The Spirit poured out on all languages, all nations. Every one of us in this room are absolute equals before God. We all carry the divine indwelling. Huh? And once you recognize that it's unearned in you, to understand, then know that it's unearned in everybody else too. And we're all in this thing together. You have just found the basis for universal compassion and for universal forgiveness and for universal patience for what we call love, <laughs> for what we call communion. That changes your politics. Huh? The idea of upper class and lower class just doesn't mean much anymore. You know, it's a, it's a social construct and nothing more. Or the color of one's skin. You know, that's a complete externalization of this marvelous mystery that we all carry inside. And now that's why teachers like Jesus push that seeing all the way to the edge to, to, to try to see the divine image, especially in those people that you wouldn't be naturally attracted to. Maybe people who are a little smelly or a little ugly or dying or not uh, so physically attractive or handicapped or something like that. Or, you know, not in your group. The, the spiritual teacher has to push you to the edge because once you can see it there, then the seeing has been achieved. <laughs> Once you can recognize the divine image where you don't want to see the divine image, then, then you've learned how to see. It's really that simple. And here's the rub. It's not you that's doing the seeing. <laughs> there, it's like there's another pair of eyes inside of you, seeing through you, seeing with you, seeing in you. Notice, for example, the very final prepositions of the great Eucharistic prayer. Through him, with him, in him. Great stuff. It recognizes that it, this isn't anything I can generate or concoct or engineer by myself. It is done to me. Not I, not I, but the wind that blows through me. It is being done to me. And all you can do is get out of the way. Now that's what you're doing at your 20 minute sit. You're getting out of the way. And the main thing you got to get out of the way is your mind. I, I, it took me years to recognize that. At first to people, it seems like an overstatement, uh, like putting too much blame on the mind. 
But in fact, it's, it is the mind that keeps defining the self, engineering and manufacturing futures, and, and worrying about past mistakes, replaying uh, past wounds, and, and so forth, over and over again. Uh, we, we now think that 90% of human thought, although some say 96%, I don't know, it matters a great deal, is repetitive and useless. It just keeps thinking the same things over and over again. And that's something. And by the time you're my age, it's even worse because you've got two or three neural grooves that you've grown used to and you just replay every event through those same three responses. That's why a lot of old people, frankly, I mean, I love old people, but if they haven't done their inner work, most old people are not much fun to be around. And you know that. Because <laughs> they've got four staid responses. <laughs> and those are the same responses to everything. What you see in the contemplative mind is a freshness of response. An originality of response. An originality of seeing. Barbara's going to be teaching you how to see, I guess, later this afternoon. And I must really be a failure because I can't draw at all. <laughs> but it's, it's, It really is, and she'll teach it better than I, is a way of, of seeing it differently. Huh? Which I guess means you have to incorporate some of the right brain. The reason I can stand here and talk the way I do is because I'm so dang left brain. And that's probably why I recognize the need for the, the limiting of this left brain. Uh, although both of them can be equally problematic in terms of defining the self. It's especially the left brain whereby we keep trying to make life linear, and make life logical, and, and make it tit for tat and quid pro quo instead of simply bearing the mystery of it. And once you bear the mystery of it, which is what the contemplative mind does, it's not looking for logic. It's not looking for quid pro quo, uh, two plus two equals four. It, that isn't important anymore. It's just to hold it in the death and in the resurrection and to allow them to somehow coexist. So contemplation, let's just draw it together on this, is, is meeting reality in its most simple and immediate form. Now to meet reality in its most simple and immediate form the only way you can do that is you've got to get rid of your mental grids, your mental ways of judging, critiquing, computing, everything. That's why the mind has to be uh, uh, somehow placed to the side. So I'm going to say that every major religion at its more mature levels is trying to give you some kind of message method to compartmentalize the mind, to put the mind to the side. Now what they found out is things like mantras, chants, anything you repeat has that effect. Uh, also be, uh, moving into the body, that's why things like breathing or pilgrimage uh, can also stop the mind, or runners say running too. Um, but uh, prayer beads are not unique to the rosary in Catholicism. If you've been to Asia, you find them all over Asia. If you go to the Islamic world, you'll see people on the streets with their prayer beads all over. Huh? Every religion has discovered that. Only Protestantism, which came along far too late in history, when we were really getting into the head and into sermons and words and Bible quotes and everything, huh? it didn't understand that anymore. It's probably the only major world religion that doesn't have something like prayer beads or chants to, to, to break you and free you from this addictive pattern of thinking. So isn't it funny that, you know, I mean, Descartes probably is the nadir of Western philosophy. And he says, the French philosopher, you know, I think, therefore I am. And here we would come along now and say, it's precisely I think Therefore, I'm not. <laughs> we say just the. It's your thinking that keeps you in this. Huh? It's your non-thinking at the level of pre pure presence, and presence cannot be thought. Try it. 
I, I think this is probably the reason God called most people to, to loving sexual relationships. Because that's one place where you can't think it. You have to experience it. You have to be present to another person. You can't have sex with your head, to my knowledge. Some men try, I think, to mentally compute the whole thing. It won't work. You have to move to the level of simply being in communion with being. And I cannot process that through the head. If you don't have any training in giving up the head, I don't think you'll ever experience being. You know, I think my first hints of this, I was a little old Catholic church altar boy back in the 1950s. And we used to have, you Catholics remember, a, a 40 hours devotion where the Eucharist was kept exposed uh, the whole weekend in the church through the night. And we altar boys were, had to sign up for the, the half hour stints in the middle of the night between 2.30 and 3 and 3.30 and 4 when no one else would sign up. I can't imagine getting altar boys to do that today. But back in the 50s, we were still very uh, obedient in those ways, I guess. But I can remember getting up in the middle of the night, riding my little bike, to the parish church, putting on my cassock and surplice, and kneeling, you had to kneel for your whole half hour. And I think that's where this first happened to me, where it all became real. There was nobody to talk to there. Do you understand? There were no ideas. There was nothing to process mentally. It's 3 o'clock you know, in the middle of the night. The whole world is asleep. And it's simply you and what for us was the image of the presence of God, the, the host, as we call it. And, um, I mean, there were experiences there where it just all connected. It was all real. It was all okay. It was all enough. It, it's probably why I became a priest. It was just I knew that the way most people were seeing was not it. <laughs> that most people are not seeing the true picture. And once you know that, once the veil parts, you know it. You can't unknow it ever again. In fact, to try to unknow it again, would, that would be sin, I think. Uh, what's, what makes you want to weep is that so many people today don't seem to know that. They really take the work-a-day world and all its clever disguises as if they're absolute foundational reality when all they are, to use Merton's phrase, is shadow and disguise. They're simply images that, they're, they're, that allow you to break, they're manifest things, as the Eastern religions say, that allow you to break through to the unmanifest. But when you stay on the level of the manifest and you never let it lead you to the unmanifest underneath it, you just don't know. Now that's contemplation. And it becomes a way of life. So I don't like to think of it so much as something you do as something you are. And so I often use the phrase the contemplative stance. It's a stance. It's a way of living and moving and walking and being in this world even though I fully admit that we don't live all our 24 hours there. I certainly don't. The world keeps pulling you back into the false self. Put on this hat. Put on this identity. Take on this hurt. Put on this self-importance. And we all do it. And it's all right, as long as you know how to take it back off. Do you follow me? And don't wear it too long. Any, any image... And the more positive one you have, the more dangerous it is. That's why I can't wear my Franciscan habit or, or priest clothes uh, too much. It's just it's too strong a, a self-image that then you have to live up to. But you can all have those. Let's say some of you have a high degree or you're a mother of six children. Or, you know, the more, the more grandiose it is, the more glorious it is, the more dangerous it is. Or if you're well-known or anything like that, then, then you, get, you tend to get more attached to it. But what we found out, and this is surprise of surprises, is that the ego is equally attached to a negative self-image. It took us a long time to recognize what we called scrupulous people, people who would come to confession almost every Saturday afternoon, were actually egocentric people. That they're very, they have to feel worthy or unworthy. To, they have to have some definition rather than to just be. 
Just nothingness, just emptiness, just I am who I am, who I am in God. Nothing more and nothing less, and that's everything. That is a hard place to live. You have to be taught how to live here. Because there's no positive or negative way you can dress yourself up. And we know now people would sooner think of themselves as sinners or bad or inferior. That gives them something to fight. Do you understand? Something to oppose so, rather than to, to live in the emptiness. So that's the language. Buddhists use emptiness. Franciscans, we use the word poverty. Carmelites use the word nothingness. The New Testament, Jesus' word is the desert. It's all about going to a place that at first feels like no thing. Nothing. There's nothing. Just, this is why it's so hard to sell. It's so hard for me to talk about it even here. It, it, it's, it's unprovable. It's unmeasurable. It's unpredictable. It's just pure being. And, and, and if you can't live at that level of pure being, you, if you constantly need a product or a performance or, or some kind of test, uh, you won't know how to live there. That is the language of the mystics. I just gave you the key. You can open up any mystic now, and they'll make sense to you. That's way, the way they're talking all the time. And if you're living at the level of capitalist consumerism where everything is product and achievement and performance and who am I and what shingle can I hang you know, on my forehead, or what name can I give myself? Uh, you won't know how to go there. So all great spirituality, certainly contemplative spirituality, is about letting go. Letting go of what you don't need. Don't need this. Don't need that. And in that, normally, you collapse back into this. And it only needs to happen once. Once you know this, you'll never be satisfied with anything less. This is what you were created for, because this is who you are. And, 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 and you know you found it then. And you don't spend the rest of your life thinking that your life is out in front of you. <laughs> that it's going to happen 10 years from now. When we get all the bills paid, and when my husband starts doing this or that now, it, it, it might as well happen. Right now, right now. And then the future, ironically, will be different. Because <laughs> you're going to bring a different self, a transformed self, a contemplative self, to those, those new situations. So this, more than anything else, brothers and sisters, is why we founded the center 15 years ago. In my first 15 years on the road, I just met so many social activists who had all the right politics, the right social analysis, the correct critique of this or that or whatever. But you could tell that there was still the need to win, the need to look good, the attachment to a superior politically correct self-image. I'm a vegetarian or I'm a, you know, a, I'm for the poor or I'm even contemplative. Well, any of those can just be new ways to uh, to concoct an ego, concoct an identity for the self. And I knew if we were going to have truly prophetic people who are going to be beyond the categories of liberal and conservative, we were going to have to teach them some way to integrate their activism with this contemplative stance. In the early years of the center, I think we, our first programs were, our first internships were about 50% social analysis and, and social critique and 50% contemplation. As the time has gone on, we've tended to make much, much more of the emphasis contemplation. And convinced that once you learn how to look out at life from this pair of eyes of the true self, that I, I just know your politics and economics are going to change. I don't need to teach you anything about don't think this way. A few little helps, like the bias from the bottom and so forth. But people will change. And then they don't feel like you're changing them. They've been changed from within. 
Uh, so you'll, you'll find that uh, uh, it really is, I believe, the most radical thing you can teach is contemplation. The most radical thing. Uh, and it's therefore the thing that a lot of people will deem the most useless because it appears to be so harmless at first, you know, just oh, a little pious way of praying. But no, it's not a way of praying, it's a way of being in the world that is absolutely different, absolutely different. It's a way of walking in the world, seeing the world that is absolutely different. So I mentioned to you before that mystics and sinners have the head start. Mystics consciously let go of these, these boundaries. Some sinners have them grabbed from them, I'm afraid. I was the jail chaplain here at the, at the city county jail for over 14 years. And, you know, you'd see the prostitutes and the, the drug addicts. And, and they know they're not great, you know. They know they've muffed up life. And you can talk to them. I, I would give sermons at the jail sometimes, especially the women. They're just tears would start... They just want it so bad, you know, because this thing hasn't worked for them. Do you understand? They haven't been able to dress this up and be the best Catholic in Oregon, you know, or in New Mexico for that. It hasn't worked. So that this might be true is just joy of joys. Oh, my God. You know? Because the, the, they long and thirst for this salvation. Whereas we who are sort of, you know, nice people like you and I are, we can sometimes be the hardest to preach the gospel to. And that seems to have been Jesus' experience. It was the church-going folks who didn't need his transformative language. Because they confused membership in an organization with transformation. Follow me? Most people have confused attendance with transformation. I mean, even a bunch of the little kids' confessions this morning, that they didn't attend Mass on Sunday. Uh, forgive me, that is, that is not in the realm of evil. That, that, that trivializes the nature of the evil, really. We've got to learn what evil means, and there's a lot of it in this world. True evil. And when we keep training people to say, I didn't go to Mass on Sunday, is evil. I think that's evil to teach people that, because it takes away from them the real notion of what evil is. It's not evil. But when you've defined religion as attendance at a service, or membership in a group, which is what an awful lot of our denominations have done, you stay right there. Everything is about group identity, group membership. It's simply this, this ego thing here glorified, that's all. And now put on to the level of group. Yes? What did you say to the children about that? You know, I, I think what I said to several of them uh, was, in some ways, what you say here isn't really so important. It's the fact that you wanted to say it. The fact that you walked through that door and you wanted to come here and talk to me, and all I am is, is I can't be God, but I'll try to think of maybe what God would want to say back to you, and that you would want to, to share your weaknesses with God that much, and let him, now you give me a chance to say back to you that you're good, you know. So you just try to contextualize it, you know? You can't dismiss what they've just said and, and trivialize that. And, and they're too young. I mean, these were mostly seven to 11 year olds. Uh, they're too young to have a mature notion of good and evil yet. But I, I try to pull them into the relational level to say the, the important thing was that you walk through that door. Yeah, what you say when you get in is all, it's, it's accidental. Who cares what you say? <laughs> it's just that you wanted to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? You asked at the right time. We're just about ending. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is evil? Oh, oh God, the big one. Uh, you know, it might fit in connection with this. A number of the scholastic philosophers and theologians said, evil is an absence of being. So, it, it's a deficit. It's not a, a bad action. This is participation in being. So in your contemplation, 
don't so much think of God as a being. Think of God as being itself, right? Not a being, but being itself. Now, what you're doing here is collapsing back into this pure being. To live separate from being in your own engineered reality, that is evil. That person will do evil and not call it evil. So, uh, uh, connect it as much as possible with separateness, autonomy, self-sufficiency. You know, the very word diabolical comes from two Greek words, diabolain, which means to throw apart, to separate. The diabolical is always the isolated, separated life. You never find a, a, a mass murderer who's a strong community person. You know? <laughs> They're always loners. They're always people who don't know how to be in communion, who don't know how to connect, who don't know how to be in relationship. So that's as good a definition as any. It's, an, it's a disconnectedness from being itself. And that person will do actions that you and I would call evil. Hopefully, you and I are tethered enough. That's probably a good image. <laughs> we'll still do little things that flirt with evil, you understand? But we're tethered enough that we know it. We say, God, that was stupid. Why did I speak to her that way? She didn't deserve that, you know? And that's the pure being pulling you back into connection. But when, you're, when you completely cut the strings and you're no longer connected to being, you will do evil and not call it evil, and that's evil. <laughs> yeah, maybe one more. Level yes, is. very much a cosmic level, Yeah, not just an individual, thank you. That's right. So I know I came to contemplation in a roundabout way, but I know you're getting more practical, specific teaching. I did give you the boat exercise, but, but it's more understanding for me the big picture of what's happening inside uh, and then maybe you can trust the specific contemplative practice in the church or in the chapel or in your own living room. Uh, because it seems that if you don't collapse back into this, at least every 24-hour period, you start getting addicted over here. This is very addictive, to understand? <laughs> to stay inside of this false self. So contemplation is any means you use, walking meditation, Rosary, Mass, a 20 minutes sit. Any means you use to experience this self is for me contemplation. And don't get hung up on the posture or the program or the procedure. Because I think as, as there are so many different personalities, there's going to be many ways to experience it. Thank, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just thinking that given those definitions, I think what I experience being... Santa Catalina, mm. um, feeling the connectedness and the yeah. depth of that connection. Yes, yes. Truly being in consciousness. Mm -hmm. See? And all mm -hmm. of the, I mean, it became limited. Yeah. And it was overwhelming. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Good for you. See, we, we've got to go in that direction. Or we're going to keep thinking that you've got to go off to monasteries to be contemplative. And as Merton said, he says, here I am in a Trappist monastery and half of these guys don't know how to contemplate. I think God had to make a way for us to be in union with God that allowed a very busy life, a very busy world. But if you can find a way to clean the lens each day, move into consciously choosing that state, I think you can live a very busy life with a crowded group of people and still keep the touchstones and live out of that conscious communion. I think women learn that in breastfeeding, I'm convinced. <laughs> and we, men don't have that access point again of, of pure communion that is not experienced through the head. And in fact, through activity. <laughs> through activity. It's probably why women have a head start. Thank you. Good. And you had a great few days, I hear. We always say it's the peace to resistance, the trip down to Juarez. Okay, now Barb's going to have you in a few minutes, are you? Good.